Hi everyone. Let's go through the review on um, Unit 4, which is all dealing with statistics and distribution curves and, and assorted things. There are two things that are posted on um, Blackboard. There is this that is completed except for what you can see is handwritten, and I'm just using the one that I completed in class. And then there's a blank one, which I would absolutely recommend that you use to see if you can, what of this you know and what of this you can take ownership of and put in your own words, make sure you truly understand it. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so let's start out with 5A, which is the fundamentals of statistics. Lots and lots of definitions. And we'll just go through those all again. Once again, as always, you are not going to be given a vocabulary test, but all of these terms will be embedded. The first one, what is statistics? It's the science of collecting, organizing, and interpreting data. And it is the data then that describes something, whatever it is that you want to know about. Okay, so these four definitions and the five steps to a basic study kind of go hand in hand. All right, so we start out with the population. This is a set of people or things being tested. This is our, the big group. This is what we want to know information about. And the char chances are we cannot poll everybody or test everybody. So a sample is a subset of the population, and this is where we get the data. The size of the population or the size of the sample and how it is determined is, you know, part of the science. The sample statistic is after we have done, retrieved our data, it is the numbers describing the characteristic of the sample. And then the population parameter is when we take this sample statistic and apply it to the population. So the sample and the sample statistic go together, the population and the population parameter goes together. So as you can see here in the five basic steps, you, what do you want to know? That's what you first do. You start, you identify your goals, and that includes identifying what you want to know and who you want to know it about. So the population is who you want to know about. Then you choose a sample. You collect the data, and that gives you the sample statistic. And then from that, you apply it to the entire population and then draw your conclusions. Okay, a representative sample, notice here when you're choosing a representative sample, it is um, a sample in which your results are going to apply to the entire population. If you want to know something that includes men and women and all you poll is women, then that is not a representative sample. Your sample would want to choose be men and women. Here are some methods of sampling. And again, you need to be able to provide an example of each of these or identify from an example which one it is. Simple random sampling is um, choosing a sample in such a way that every sample of the same size has an equal chance of being selected. Systematic is when uh, you use some kind of simple system. You pick every fifth person name on a list, or you pick everyone with red hair, or, you know, sitting in the fourth row in the classroom, or whatever. Convenient sampling is the easy one. You, just, you choose one that's convenient. You don't take into consideration <coughs> whether or not it will be representative or anything else, just what's easiest. And then stratified is if you take your group and turn it into subgroups that are different. Again, either men or and women, or it could be, you know, I don't know, you could split it racially. You could do anything that you wanted that, but you would expect different results from different samples. Okay, now bias is when the design of conduct of a statistical study tends to favor certain results. Okay? Most studies will have some sort of bias. It's really hard not to. Okay, then we're going to talk about um, the types of statistical studies. But before we do, we need to know what a placebo is. 
And a placebo is, you know, if, in medication, it's usually a sugar pill. It's something that looks exactly like the medication being tested, but has no impact. It has no effect. The placebo effect is when someone is given the placebo, they believe they're receiving the treatment, and they give the result of somebody who would be treated. Okay, the types of statistical studies are observational or experiment. Observation is when all you do is observe. You do not attempt to influence or modify the characteristics. You just watch and see what people do and record the data. I think one of the examples we did in class was about eating green leafy vegetables. And um, so you don't force them to eat the vegetables or not eat the vegetables. You just observe the results of those who do and those who do not. An experiment, then, is when you apply a treatment to some or all of the sample members and observe the effects. So again, it is, if you want to use the leafy vegetable thing, you would split the group and give a, half of them, force them to eat green leafy vegetables, and the other group, don't allow them to eat leafy vegetables. Okay. So that would be splitting you into the treatment and control group. The treatment group would be those who get the leafy vegetables. The control group would be those who don't. Then the placebo group, that wouldn't apply there, but it would be a group that um, didn't get the, get the medication but thought they did. Then a single blind and double blind study are who know, it just depends on who knows what groups are which. If you're looking at a, um, an observational study, it's either going to be retrospective or case controlled. And an observational study uses data from the past. And it naturally is divided into cases and controlled. Cases are those who engaged in the behavior. So in the situation with the leafy vegetables, these would be the people who eat the leafy vegetables. These are who don't. Now, when you're dealing with a sample and when you apply it to a population, you have, you're going to have a margin of error. Unless you test everybody, you're not going to know exactly what the statistic is. But a margin of error is a number used to describe how well the sample statistic is likely to approximate the true population parameter. So again, there, there are ways to figure out what the, the margin of error is. But it's a number, and so you would have your sample statistic plus or minus some number. And especially since we just had the election, you saw it, we did the, the whole the Trump-Biden thing where it was 42.52 with a margin of error of 3.5. That means that from <clears throat> the statistic, the, four, the 42 percent, the margin of error would mean that it would go anywhere from uh, three and a half below 42 to three and a half above 42. So your sample statistic would be here in the middle. Your confidence interval would be when you take your sample statistic and you subtract the margin of error, add the margin of error, and that range is um, where the population, population parameter is going to be. So lots of vocabulary there and just know how to utilize them. 5B then talked about, um, should you believe a statistical study? All right, and being skeptical and just by nature and plus knowing the math, I'm always wanting to know. And that was, that's always my big problem when they do the projections and stuff on TV is they don't give you enough information. Um, so you want to get a big picture. You want to consider the source. Look for bias. Look for problems in defining or measure the variables of interest. Beware of confounding variables, which we'll talk about later. Consider the setting and wording of the surveys. Check that the results are prevented fairly. And stand back and consider the, the conclusions. What does it really mean? Okay, so it says in number three, look for bias. And there are two different kinds of bias. Selection bias and participation bias. Selection bias is when they select their sample in a way that would make it unrepresentative of the population. This would be um, like a, a convenient sampling. You know, are you just doing the ones that are the easiest? Participation bias is when people choose to participate, a telephone survey. You have to take into account that a lot of people do not want to participate in a telephone 
survey and usually it's only those who have really strong opinions. If you don't really care about something, you're not going to waste your time with it. Then we talked about one of the things in here is it says um, look for problems in defining or measuring the variables of interest. Okay, a variable can be any item or quantity that can vary or take on different values. Variables of interest are the variables that they seek to measure. Confounding variables are variables that are not intended to be part of the study, but they can have an impact on the results. So make sure that you're not looking at your, you can have multiple variables in any situation, but the variable is inter, of interest is what you're really talking about, and confounding variables can be involved in it, but are not intended to. Okay. 5C went in to talk about statistical graphs and tables, and this was split into the types of data. And this is really important. Okay. Is it quantitative or qualitative? Quantitative is measured or counted, where your data is going to be numbers. Qualitative describes qualities. So we're looking at categories. There are two types of graphs under quantitative, a histogram, and a line graph. In a histogram, across your horizontal axis are your vari variable values in bins. So if you're doing, um, I don't know, um, temperature. You know, if you want to find the average body temperature of, of, of you know, people in Texas. Okay, you would have like body temperature of 96 to 97, 97 to 98, 98 to 99, and so on and so forth. So those would be your variable values. And then your frequency would be how many of your subjects have a temperature within that value. Notice on here the bars touch. The bars are all the same width, but the bars are different heights. They're the same width because the bins must be the same size. The bars touch and the bins must be the same size. And then the frequency, the height, tells you how many answered within that answer. Then a line graph is identical to this where you have your variable values and your frequency. And what you do when you're looking at here is you take the center of your bin and put a dot then a dot, another dot, another dot, another dot, and connect your dots with lines. So that if you were to draw in your bins here, it would be the same as what you see above. Except I can't do that very well. Okay, then when you're doing qualitative, it describes quality. This is when you poll people and say, oh, okay, the one we did in class was about fast food, or what is your favorite color? The answer is not a number. The answer is a category. So on your horizontal axis, you're going to have your category, and then how many, if you're dealing with numbers, if you're dealing with frequency, you're going to have a bar chart, and the height will tell you how many people, pink, blue, orange, green. The bars don't touch, they are the same width, and each bar represents a category. And normally, just for ease of reading, you, nor you normally put them in descending order, so you always start with the tallest and then work your way down. A pie chart is when you're de still dealing with categories, but you're dealing with percentage. You don't know how many people were polled, you don't have a number, but you know that 40% of them said this, 20% of them said this, and 40% said this. Here you would be able to say, well, 19 people said this, 17, 16, 8. But you don't know the numbers here, but you know that the total of the pie adds to 100%. Okay, there is some vocabulary for the histogram. The bin is the range of values all the same width. Again, if that you were dealing with temperature, you would, if you wanted to go up in degree increments, that would be fine, or half a degree, what it, however many you're pulling, or whatever data you want. The right-hand rule means that the endpoint is included in the bar to the right. 
So for example, if you were dealing with um, temperatures and you did 97 to 98, and then 98 to 99, 98 would go in this bin. This would be 97 to 97.9999999. Anything that's 98 would go into the next bin. The frequency is the number of data points in the bin. That, of course, goes for a bar chart as well. And then the relative frequency is the frequency as a percent, which means frequency over total. Okay, as you're doing this, remember when you're creating a histogram, remember that you're also thinking about doing a frequency table. The last part of five is scatter plots and correlation. A scatter plot is just a tool to examine uh, two variable relationships. You've got one variable on this axis, one variable on this axis, and each dot represents a data point, and that data point has this characteristic and this characteristic. Okay. These are numbers, they are not categories. This is also called the x-axis, the y-axis, or the independent and dependent variables. So if it's going up from left to right, then it's positive. If it's going down from left to right, it's negative. And if it's just all over the place, it's none. So in addition to positive, negative, or none, you need to look at whether there, it is a strong or a weak correlation. Strong means that the points are close to the trend line. So you can see here if you draw, drew an oval around them, it would be long and skinny. Here, your oval is a little bit fatter. And here, it's just all over the place. So this would be characterized as positive strong. This would be negative weak. And this would be none. Now, the other thing we need to know is when we're looking at a graph, you can compare any two items. They don't have to be related. One doesn't have to cause the other. It could just be a, a coincidence. Or there could be something else that causes both of them. So the correlation versus causation, a coincidence, is there is no relationship between the variables. I think the, one that, the weirdest one I've ever seen is the one that compares the number of pirates and the average temperature. There is a, a correlation, but, excuse me, there is, a, you can create a scatter plot with it, but there's, no, there's nothing, they don't have anything to do with each other. A common underlying cause, I think one of the ones we did in class dealt with sunglasses and ice cream or, or something along those nature. You know, as the, again, that was a positive correlation, but buying sunglasses and buying ice cream does not cause buying buying ice cream or vice versa. What is What we did discover was that there is an underlying cause for both of them and both sales would go up as the temperature gets warmer. And a direct cause would be when one variable directly causes the other. And that, those are usually pretty easy to determine. Okay, well that is chapter five, so I'm going to switch videos and then we will go to chapter six.